big hairy problems in technology policy from cloud governance to internet governance to cybersecurity. And we have a very important initiative, uh, the Partnership for Countering Influence Operations. Um, I've been involved with the Internet Governance Forum and the Internet Governance Forum USA since my days at IBM uh, before either organization even existed. And I have to say, uh, it's really been great to see how this organization has evolved and particularly how IGF USA has become such an important place to go to discuss the future of the internet and uh, the policies that shape it. Uh, last year, we went virtual for the first time. I thought it worked incredibly well. This year, I think it's working even better. And that is um, because we've been able to recruit an all-star cast from all around the country. And that uh, means we are going to be able to take a lot of different looks at the issues on the table. Um, I am in many ways glad that this is the last panel because we're going to touch on many of the topics that were dealt with in earlier panels. Uh, Internet of Things security, data protection, digital identity, internet filtering, content moderation, censorship. These are all tough, tough issues and they are global issues. The problem is that in each case, the first knee-jerk reaction of policymakers, both in national capitals and in state capitals, is to ban or block problematic apps or websites or technologies, uh, even if there's a lot of collateral damage. So our job today is to look at what's happening, what national governments and state governments are doing to try to control or shape the internet, and then talk about alternative approaches that meet their policy goals without necessarily, um, uh, without the collateral damage. So I'm gonna introduce each speaker in turn, starting with Nick Merrill. Uh, Nick is going to do the very hard job of giving us an overview of how the um, different countries are taking action to try to block the net at different layers in the stack, different techniques they might use, and what that looks like when you actually look at how traffic is flowing, uh, where it's flowing, where it's not flowing. And so anyway, Nick is the director of the Daylight Lab at UC Berkeley. He's a very data intensive guy, but uh, today we're not gonna show a lot of slides. He's just gonna give us the data blocking, data filtering, internet control 101 lecture. So over to you, Nick. All right, thanks for the introduction, Michael. Um, let me share some slides with you. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see these. Again, my name is Nick Merrill, I run Daylight Lab at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And today I'm going to tell you the what and why of internet fragmentation. So before we dive in, the most important thing to understand about the internet is that it is composed of different technologies that are layered on top of each other in what's often called a stack. You often hear about the internet stack. And at the bottom of that stack, we have the physical connections that you know connect the internet together, undersea cables, terrestrial cables, make the internet work. Um, and various technologies are built on top of these physical cables all the way up to this kind of legal or human layer. Now, fragmentation or censorship or blocking, whatever you'd like to call it, can happen at any layer of the stack. The most basic or brute way to do this is to simply disconnect or cut the cables. It is a rough tool, but it has 100% success at disconnecting people. And at various other layers of the stack, there are ways to um, do some more fine-grained blocking. The very, very top layer, you can go and sue or arrest someone who sees content they're not supposed to see. Uh, an obvious or, or at least a well-publicized example of this is that the RIAA or MPAA used to go after people who pirated music or movies. Um, and in between these layers, you have things like the Great Firewall and other ways of blocking websites. The point here is that methods for fragmenting the internet are diverse. There are many different ways you can technically implement website blocking, and the details are out of scope for this talk. Now, just because there are diverse ways for blocking content, it doesn't mean we can't make comparisons. 
What you see here is a map or rather a force directed graph of similarities among different countries in what kind of content is available online. Countries who block similar types of content are closer together in this map. What you can see here is that there's one cluster. I well, guess I don't have my uh, a pointer here, but one cluster what basically represents this global or mostly global internet. Around that cluster, there are uh, some countries that are flirting with a bit of censorship, countries like uh, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Bulgaria, Ukraine. They aren't sure how free or, let's say, open, un, you know, uh, 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 unregulated their internet should be. And then you have around the periphery some countries that do extensive blocking. China's pattern of blocking, as you can see, is somewhat unique. Venezuela's is extremely unique. They only basically block things that are embarrassing to uh, political leadership there. And then we have a cluster on the periphery that's kind of similar to one another. Russia, India, uh, India uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Korea, they're really interested in blocking pornography, content related to drugs, um, content related to illegal gambling. Uh, so what you see here, basically, although the strategies here are diverse, uh, there are patterns at the global level as far as what uh, makes different things accessible. Now that we've covered kind of what fragmentation is, what it looks like, a key question is what drives internet fragmentation? And another way of asking this question, the way I like to ask this question, why fragmentation? of all the things that could happen to the global internet, why is fragmentation the thing that we see? Okay, here is some background, some necessary background to uh, kind of tee up the answer to this question, my answer to this question. Number one, there are only three points here. Here's point number one. Point number one is that the internet both reflects and shapes geopolitics. The internet that we observe is the reflection of different kind of geopolitical relationships, relationships between states. And also as the internet you know, takes on its configuration, that internet goes on to shape geopolitics. And there's some great work on this. Uh, you can follow this link to the slides, which I'll make accessible after this talk. Uh, Limonier et al, that just came out earlier this year. Point number two, regional blocks, that is blocks that order under the same set of rules and principles may usurp globalization as the dominant global order, as the dominant logic by which the world is organized. There's a great uh, book about this that my uh, postdoc advisor, Steve Weber, just published called Block by Block. Again, you can follow up this link to learn more about uh, uh, this issue. But the idea here, again, globalization, as we all know, may be waning in its popularity. What may emerge instead are these regional blocks. Point number three, Currently, the US dominates the global internet. I've written at length about this. Again, there's a link you can follow where I have a blog post that kind of lays this out. Uh, also, Milton Muller has a great book called Will the Internet Fragment uh, that covers this in some detail as well. So these are the three critical points uh, that you must understand about the internet before we can answer the question about why fragmentation. So why fragmentation? Well. Internet fragmentation is the observable, of, I'm sorry, the observable effect of nations challenging the US's dominance over the internet. Another way of saying this, uh, internet fragmentation reflects this global shift away from globalization and toward these quote unquote regional blocks. These are basically two ways of saying the same thing. You can meditate on why or how they are the same thing uh, somewhat later. But quickly, and before I wrap up, I'll tell you one more thing. We can detect these emerging blocks by measuring internet fragmentation. I have uh, this op-ed, which you can follow, show me who bans TikTok, and I'll show you your future allies. The idea here, again, is that um, there is a correlation between the internet and geopolitics. They reflect and shape one another. Oh, have I frozen here? Oh, dear. It appears you have. Uh, it might be good to use the chat to share the uh, URL for your editorial. Sure thing. Assuming you can still hear me, I will do that. Um, and please, whoever's in charge, feel free to stop my screen sharing as it appears to be frozen. Well, thank. Are, are you wrapping up? Are you wrapped up now? 
I, I uh, unfortunately have no choice. I will say uh, only one more thing, which is that, uh, you know, uh, basically this map that you saw earlier, these clusters, you can imagine those clusters, and again, I'm sorry, you can't see the slide, uh, moving around over time. And this is basically using these internet measurements, how we detect geopolitical changes, forecast to the degree that we can geopolitical changes using internet measurement. And with that, I will wrap up. My name is Nick Merrill. Um, you can follow me on Substack at nickmerrill.substack.com. And thank you, Michael, for, for letting me give this brief introduction. Well, thank you for rising to the occasion and the challenge. That was not easy to do. And I think we all have a better sense of how and why the net is being blocked. Uh, I've been to lots of panels on the splinter net and what happens when different countries try to impose different rules and restrictions on the global internet. I know that a lot of people on the call have also done that. There are lots of good work, lots of good work being done by organizations like the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, uh, Access Now, the Internet, to name just three organizations. What, what's different with this panel is that we are looking at scenarios that don't just explore what is happening, they explore why it's happening and what might happen in the next five years that would accelerate this trend towards segmentation, splintering of the internet. And in particular, we're gonna look at uh, four different things that are causing nations to take action. Um, in every case that we're gonna explore, there's probably three or four different things going on. Uh, there's always a little bit of protectionism. There's always a little bit of national pride. But in each of our, our four scenarios that each of our four speakers are gonna talk about, there are, there, there's a key question that countries are trying to answer. And so um, those questions are first, uh, how can a country protect itself better from cyber attacks? Second question is how can governments protect their citizens' private personal data? A third driver question that's causing nations to try to segment the internet and impose their own rules within their boundaries is just fear of foreign content and apps. You know, do I want my kids playing with some game from another country? And then the last issue is about cybercrime and terrorism. How is the internet being used by people who would do my citizens harm? Um, so these are lingering issues, but those of us involved in politics know that what often happens is some big incident kind of drives action. 9-11 uh, gave us the USA Patriot Act. And it's possible that in the coming years, we will see something like the colonial pipeline hack that led us to all learn what ransomware was, but something even worse, 10, 20, 30 times worse that could lead to a flood of legislation, not just in Washington, but in capitals around the world. So I'm gonna ask you to give us a four minute speculation. How is it that the internet could go bad, break apart in the next five years. And most importantly, how can we change the conversation, give people new answers to their questions? So our first topic is cyber attacks. And our first speaker is Melissa Hathaway. Melissa Hathaway. She's the president of Hathaway Global Strategies. And she worked for both the Bush administration and the Obama administration in the White House designing a comprehensive national security strategy. And I'm going to turn it to her. Not an easy task, but give us your thoughts on where are we going and is fear of cyber attack going to lead to the fragmentation of the net? Thanks, Mike. I, uh, I'm really happy to be here with uh... Many of my colleagues, so nice to see you again. I wish we were all in person, to be honest with you. Um, absolutely, cyber attacks pose an increasing risk to our public health and safety, to our critical infrastructures and services, and to the vital national networks. And what's happening is, is that Russia, China, United States, and many other countries are starting to install government-controlled filters um, and monitoring of malicious traffic on the key critical infrastructures and national networks. We're seeing data localization uh, being imposed to uh, pr pronounce um, 
government authority over these critical networks. You're seeing the declaration of trusted and untrusted companies um, and therefore their applications and services that might be uh, brought about. We're seeing challenges with data portability and we're seeing now the emergence of an arms control conversation that has been accelerated by the attacks that we have seen. I think it's important to put it into a context. I'm just going to go back five years um, of where I think the inflection point began. And this was the acceleration of governments intervening in the marketplace and starting to declare sovereignty over the infrastructures and the data that transits them. And I think that the, the, the seminal year really was 2017. In May of 2017, you had the first globally uh, implemented ransomware conducted by North Korea called WannaCry. It affected rail, telecom, healthcare services, brought down the majority of the UK's healthcare system. A month later, it was followed by NotPetya, which was attributed to conduct by Russia of a weaponized software update that actually destroyed key uh, industries around the world in more than 100 countries and caused more than $100 billion of economic impact. And within that, you saw... <clears throat> key transportation and logistics systems brought offline with one of the most important companies being hit was Maersk Shipping that represented 7% of Denmark's GDP. It took them months to recover and you started to see a national conversation um, in many countries starting to talk about what needs to be done. And then that very same month, you saw uh, a uh, industrial control system, operational technologies from Triton, uh, Trisis malware, which was targeted against Schneider Electric's industrial control systems, was designed to sabotage and map the networks and conduct remote control over those operational networks. And as you know, it actually brought about a challenge with a chemical facility in Saudi Arabia that could have actually been a natural disaster. 2018 was the year of the data breach of collecting personal identifiable information with the top five breaches being Marriott, Equifax, Cathay Pacific, Facebook, and British Airways. And you started to see the monetization of our citizen data in the underground market and profiling for the air, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms where we're starting to see algorithmic warfare being used to perfect the new algorithms that are behind the facial recognition, recognition technology. In 2019, it was ad hoc innovation. It was blocking the internet by authoritarian governments to actually promote their own political stability in 35 countries. Um, you saw DNS hijacking and targeted malware against core infrastructures. And you saw the unique use of drones now to shut down aircraft and, and key airports in Newark, New Jersey, London, uh, United Kingdom, and in Milan, Italy. They... 2020 was the year to exploit and, and exploit the situation of COVID. And you saw that really the rapid uptake of ransomware and distributed denial of service attacks up almost 700% in key markets. The theft of, of uh, and disruption of vaccine research uh, and then key things that happened in the United States, you had United Healthcare Services brought offline, 250 hospitals in the United States no longer able to service the sick. You had Israel and Iran going back and forth between the port uh, systems and the water supply systems. And then, of course, we ended 2020 with the, the largest breach of an ICT industry and undermining the trusted fabric of every enterprise and critical infrastructure with solar winds, which we still see today. 2021 brought it home with the beginning of the colonial pipeline knocking off oil and gas in the whole East Coast of the United States, conducted by another ransomware gang, JBS Foods, who uh, had significant economic costs and started to think about agriculture safety, food supply safety, when you no longer can move beef or pork into the marketplace. The latest last week was Kaseya with the uh, knocking off another IT industry of bringing about liability to the small and medium businesses and knocking off the food supply of all of Sweden with one supplier. Ireland's healthcare system brought down for more than a month, Florida water supply nearly poisoned, and you start to see further and further of what's going on. So yes, cyber attacks have significant impact 
countries are taking responsibility for protecting their citizens, for protecting the critical national services. And you're starting to see, an, I think, an escalatory aspect between countries that could lead to, uh, could lead to conflict. And so therefore, the reactions that are happening is the governments are installing government controlled filters and monitoring. You're seeing governments start to take action, extraterritorial action against other states to be preventative of trying to take down those malicious activities before they can prevent further or conduct more harm. We're seeing trusted and untrusted companies being blocked or accelerated in the marketplace. Data portability will continue to be challenged as governments start to monetize the data, localize the data, and declare the data sovereign territory of their government. Arms control negotiations are on the rise, are going to be on her horizon. And I think the next five years, you're just going to see this accelerate and the tensions between countries going to continue to rise. Thank you. I look forward to the next scenario. Thank you very much. That, that may be the scariest one. Um, our next speaker is Harriet Pearson. Uh, I got to know Harriet when I was in the office next to hers at IBM in Washington. She became the first chief privacy officer of IBM, one of the first corporate chief privacy officers anywhere. Uh, in the last four or five years, she's been not only continuing her work in data privacy, she's also become a, a leader on cybersecurity law and uh, working with com companies around the world as senior counsel at Hogan Lovells. So I can't think of a better person to cover the question of mm -hmm. how are conflicting privacy rules and requirements for data protection going to lead to fragmentation of the net. Hi, thanks, Mike. And uh, I hope folks can hear me. It's good to be with you all. Um, I am uh, uh, marking, I, I'm not sure I'm celebrating, but at least I'm marking my 25th year of working on these issues, privacy um, and backing in from privacy and data protection into data security and then cybersecurity. And um, I'll paint a little bit of a picture uh, around uh, both um, privacy and data protection, as well as data localization. Um, I may have a, a little bit of a good news story, in my view, at least, privacy and data protection laws and concerns. Um, uh, you know, on the global scale, uh, I think the, the battle uh, or the, the debate over uh, should there be law or not law, should the internet be regulated and um, you know, what we were discussing 25 years ago, which was let's rely on self-regulation until there's a need for uh, law in, um, in uh, you know, data protection or privacy. I think that that discussion and debate is over now. The question is, well, how is, is, is the how? Uh, largely around the world, um, privacy laws, if uh, one looks at uh, Professor Graham Greenleaf's uh, compendium and he tracks every year the number of uh, privacy and data protection laws adopted globally, the, uh, the rise has been pretty impressive over the last 15 years, um, over 100 or you know, some large number of countries around the world now have adopted uh, laws that are somewhat similar to what I'll call European style laws, uh, comprehensive laws that um, treat information that relates to an identifiable in, uh, individual. And that's a pretty broad definition. Uh, treat it with a, uh, I'll call it a cradle to grave uh, set of obligations that apply to usually private sector, kind of corporate uh, company or non uh, law enforcement entities. And that um, the rise of, of those types of laws being adopted is, is one phenomenon I think that uh, will continue. Uh, it can't go that fast over the next five years, but it's already kind of uh, been been substantially accomplished. And um, the United States is discussing at the federal level, of course, such legislation. Although I don't think it'll be of the same uh, detail with well, the same details. Um, the important thing for the internet and fragmentation uh, potentially is the data. There's a data transfer obligation embedded in many of these laws that relates to access or transfer of information that relates to an individual, usually known as personal data. And the question is, well, how can that be accomplished in a um, reasonable and not overly burdensome way? And is, is it blocked? And the short answer from, a, I'll, I'll say from a lawyer's uh, perspective, uh, and, and you know, my, my, my colleagues and I have been working for many kinds of companies facilitating transfers and global flows, 
is that the, um, it, you know, it, it, it will, it is becoming, it has become more burdensome, more compliance focused to transfer information or access information across borders for commercial purposes. There is no doubt about it. Um, but I think the counter here is that um, there are there are mechanisms for doing this. Is it as easy as it was uh, back uh, 25 years ago? No, uh, it is not. Uh, it comes with maturation. And the question is, well, how will we shape it? How will those mechanisms work? I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, heard of and perhaps looked at and, and uh, worked with this concept of the privacy shield, which was famously invalidated a few years ago by a, a decision in the European Court of Justice uh, called Schrems II. Um, you know, there are mechanisms being put in place to um, address the concerns over government, uh, you know, government surveillance and uh, capabilities and other uh, issues that led to the European Court of Justice ruling. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Europe recently uh, announced uh, a new and updated set of what they call standard contractual clauses, which are um, approved for use with some other guidance uh, and some direction on uh, facilitating the legal legitimate uh, flow of data from Europe to other, uh, other, other jurisdictions. That is an important marker. Um, there will be ways to, to facilitate uh, uh, transfers. And um, with respect to the EU and the US, uh, discussions are underway at a political level with um, the new administration here uh, you know, uh, working on facilitating a uh, updated, renewed, uh, whatever it will be called, the, the privacy shield, which is a handshake between the two jurisdictions um, to facilitate even further uh, for particularly for smaller companies or companies that want to have the ease of, of that mechanism um, for, for, for going forward. Um, trade based agreements um, uh, are, are also places to address uh, personal data flows and um, and I think there, there have been some examples of, of success there. And uh, Europe, Europe has uh, increased the number of countries or jurisdictions that it finds, quote unquote, adequate under its law, uh, for example, Japan so, um, and others. And uh, while one can find a lot to discuss and debate around the mechanisms and the particulars of these laws, data protection or consumer privacy laws, um, overall, I would say the DNA of these laws, about 80, 85% of the requirements are somewhat similar. And so for uh, those operating globally, uh, there is a way, there are practical ways to construct a global looking view of uh, what is the organization's approach to data privacy, data protection from a commercial perspective. Note, I'm not dealing, I'm not touching the government access to information, government surveillance issue. That is complicated, but it was always there. It was always fragmented. Uh, and uh, there, I think I would uh, kind of uh, go back up to Melissa's point and probably the other, uh, the others will speak to, uh, you know, this is where discussions uh, need to occur around how we, you know, various blocks in how one does uh, deal with government access to information. There are obviously in the United States have been a fair amount of de debate and legal uh, work around. And oh, so, so Harriet, before we get into that, that yes. would be another half hour lecture. I'm so not going let's, to, yes. Let's not talk about government access. I will not. Um, the bright spot here is two bright spots to know about is um, 80 to 90% of steps to comply with these laws are common. These frameworks can be interoperable and uh, privacy by design and privacy engineering. Uh, for those of you that are technologically oriented or process oriented, I, there is a fair amount of energy in that discipline and it, that um, kind of development of discipline and a framework like the NIST privacy framework can enable an international approach to embedding privacy concepts, data protection concepts into technology, which is promising. Uh, not easy, but promising, and I think it will advance over the next few years. Data localization, a harder issue to address. I think it's thorny because the motivation and drivers here are sensitivity of data for governments. Uh, they want to facilitate law enforcement ac uh, access, and there's outright protectionism. And so there, uh, there are risks associated with localization that have to be managed, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was a very tough task, but you did it very well. Uh, I think the even tougher task will be our next speaker, uh, 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 <laughs> Deji Olukatan, who is with Sonos. Uh, you got him. 
<laughs> uh, thank you very much. We, we practiced it the other day when we talked. Um, but uh, he's, he's sort of a multi-stakeholder man. Uh, he is with the corporate world now, but he used to work uh, at Access Now. And before that was uh, the, the, the person who launched the Digital Freedom Program at PEN America. And he also writes science fiction. So he does a lot of scenarios, knows how to do them. And he gets to do a scenario or three or four on how cultural differences between countries could lead to fragmentation of the internet and um, take it away. Thanks. Um, thanks, Mike. So I am definitely talking in my personal capacity here, and I'm going to shift up the tone a lot. Um, I took a, a pretty broad interpretation of your mandate. I'm actually going to read you a little tiny flash fiction. Um, so this is called The Blue Hot Blues. It's the year 2026. There is a hotly contested election in Texas that is going to tip the balance of the U.S. Senate. Two weeks before the election, the candidate Lucy Garbazian dies of cardiac arrest while on a private weekend retreat. Only her family and inner circle know of her death, but the election is so close that if the news were revealed, the opposing candidate would surely win. With so much at stake, Garbazian's team hastily decides to cover up the death, believing that her normally secluded lifestyle would prevent journalists from asking too many questions. Just in case, her team uses off-the-shelf deepfake technology from Russia to release a 15-second campaign video in which she yells, hook em horns, on the eve of an important college football game. Watching the campaign video late at night while smoking legal cannabis, Hot Tweed, the popular blue hop artist, where blue hop is a combination of bluegrass and hip-hop, questions the authenticity of the Carbazian campaign video. He releases a song on YouTube that goes, Garbazian, home range alien, don't rob me, show me the body. The banjo riff is surprisingly catchy, but more than that, it catches fire and goes viral for a few minutes until YouTube's AI flags the video for takedown and automatically refers the video to the police for inciting violence against a public official. Pat Tweed is detained the following day and spends the election behind bars until he can post bail. The election proceeds as expected, and Garbazian wins by a narrow margin. Hot Tweed is vindicated by the announcement that Garbazian has died and talks to a popular podcast host. The news leads to protests, riots, and undermines trust in the political process. So there are two reactions to this scenario from 2026. First one is a negative one. Legislators around the world introduced bills banning deep fakes and mandating digital platforms to take them down. Anyone possessing deep fake technology is subject to civil or criminal penalties, including in the medical profession. Worldwide, countries shut down the internet around elections, citing concerns about interference in deep fakes. And as a cruel aside, advertisers pull their ads from any videos or content with blue hop music. Positive scenario. Stakeholders restore trust in the political process. A well-funded global multi-stakeholder body on deep fakes involving academia, government, industry, and civil society is formed. A clearinghouse, the clearinghouse quickly and expeditiously labels videos of public concern as authentic or not based on their deep fake algorithms in near real time. There's transparency around decisions in both plain English and machine readable format. And there's ESG reporting on how platforms handle deep fakes, leading to investor scrutiny of platforms. Human rights principles of free expression and proportionality are used as a lens. And internet shutdowns around elections lead to international sanctions. There are cultural changes as well. People build reality networks. These are associations constructed from empirically verified truths with trusted interoperability between these networks. These reality networks are grounded in the offline world and linked to online communities through new methods of authentication. Finally, Blue Hop surges in popularity and Hot Tweed sweeps the Grammy Awards. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll have to reconvene in five years to see, or in, uh, in, in five years to see, or I guess it will be five years to see what has happened November of. 2026. Okay, David, 
give us the scenario for cyber criminals setting our policy. All right. Well, thank you. And it's very hard to follow on the heels of that quite impressive. Uh, and, and actually all the speakers before me, but I will try and do my best. <clears throat> I was going to say that that I often approach conversations like this, like jazz. Uh, I do do jazz improv and I try to build off the things that have been said, both in the chats as well as what's come before me. And so maybe I'm doing blue hop uh, this time. So uh, trying to, to, to make it move forward. So uh, on, on cybercrime, I'd like to put forward a premise, which is the good news is we've succeeded in democratizing internet technologies. The bad news is we've succeeded in democratizing internet technologies. And so that means people can now do things that were only possible uh, either by large nation states uh, 20 or 30 years ago, or some very large corporations. And we already heard a little bit about what's happening in the era of uh, what's possible as we see with deep fakes. But the reality is you don't even need deep fakes right now to do some of these cyber crimes. And of course, the biggest one, as we heard from Melissa, is, is ransomware, which has gone from, I believe, it was uh, four years ago, it was $5 billion in estimated total global damages up to then 10 billion the following year to then 20.2 billion. And so anybody's guess as to what ransomware damages will be this year, but it's not on a good trend. Um, and what we're seeing is it's, it's, it's cybercrime, but it also seems to be cybercrime, I won't say as a political tool, but it seems at least sanctioned as long as it's not used against your own uh, country uh, in some cases. And so we're, we're seeing that be in a bit of an issue. Uh, as some of you may know, some of this ransomware, uh, if you go ahead and put your keyboard in a certain Cyrillic alphabet, it actually deactivates some of the ransomware. I'm not saying you go and do that, but that's an interesting sort of finding there. And so um, we, are, we are facing the challenge that, uh, as said earlier by, by Nick, um, it could very well be the reason why we're seeing a rise in ransomware, aside from the fact that these tools are getting democratized, is we're also seeing increasing uh, failed nation states. Uh, and so this is a way to make money, as long as you don't do it to yourself. Uh, it's a way to sort of import capital from overseas. And so it raises interesting questions in terms of both how do we address it? Uh, is this something that, you know, can a small startup ever expect to have the suite of tools that a large company or a large government organization might have to defend itself? Uh, could, you know, several industries that, you know, whether it be schools or libraries, do we expect them to spend the money necessary to defend themselves? Um, or is this something that we need to actually start thinking about um, ransomware protection as a utility? And so I raise this as something to think about in terms of moving forward. Uh, but it's not just cyber, it's not just ransomware as the things that we need to be facing. Uh, we're seeing increasing uh, phishing and whaling um, in terms of impersonations. Uh, we did see about a year and a half ago what was, or at least rumored to be, a deep fake audio that impersonated the CEO and requested a transfer of funds. And unfortunately, before anyone thought otherwise, the funds were transferred and then they disappeared. And this is being um, aided in some respects by the increasing use of uh, cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin being one, but not the only one. Uh, the good news story is it does seem behind the scenes that governments have developed relationships with some of the uh, cryptocurrency platforms. You may have seen after the Colonial Pipeline attack, uh, there was apparently a um, stop of the payment before it actually reached the individuals. And so that's a uh, success that probably went behind the scenes and, and, and should be celebrated. But it does raise questions, which is, Will we see nations, I mean, China has already banned Bitcoin uh, more for the concerns about power usage, but will we see other nations say, we don't want to allow cryptocurrencies to exist, not only for the power concerns, but it's aiding and abetting uh, ransomware payments. And, and, and I would say that, that that may not be purely for those reasons why they say and do that. Uh, at the same time that we see the rise in cryptocurrencies, we see nation states themselves launch central bank digital currencies. Uh, China is currently piloting one. So is Europe. The United States has, has made intimations that it's thinking about a digital dollar. Um, but it may very be convenient when you, rate, when you launch your central bank digital currency for your nation to also at the same time ban certain cryptocurrencies for those reasons uh, to make the swing back to uh, central bank digital currencies. And, and that then raises back to Harriet's point, which is, are we comfortable with the privacy that these currencies may collect uh, in terms of private information, in terms of banking transactions, in terms of what you've spent uh, and what could be done with that data? Even if we say it's been de-identified, as we know, even the best attempts at de-identification, if you have enough data sets, you can abstract it back to the individual. So cryptocurrencies being a concern. Uh, the last thing I would say is 
uh, we should be prepared for this to get messier and harder. Uh, for what Melissa said, I am also on the side that I think there's going to be increasing cybercrime just because that's where the money is. Why do people rob banks? It's because where the money is. Why do people go after data? It's because that's where the money is as well. And so until we come up with a better approach to dealing with data, expect the data to be held hostage and, and a source of funds because there's, there's value in it. But the other thing that we should be watching for is space. And this may sound kind of strange, but we already see, obviously, Starlink. There's other efforts that are going there. I, uh, at the Geotech Center, we are working with companies that are actually thinking about putting in, in space memory and processing power that will, uh, when we look back at it, will be uh, quite tremendous in terms of the capabilities that are possible. And when you can process things in space, you do have to ask, whose geopolitical jurisdiction is it? Is it the jurisdiction that actually chose to launch the satellites? Uh, is it something else? And how do we make sure we don't end up launching the new Silk Web in space uh, and all the challenges that may come from that as well? So uh, it's going to be an interesting future. The last thing I'll say is at the Atlantic Council Geotech Center, 2020 was a very challenging year, as I imagine for all of us, not just with the pandemic, but we actually succeeded in creating bipartisan consensus on what the United States at least means for tech for good in a bipartisan sense with regards to secure data and communications, with regards to trust in the digital economy, resilient supply chains, digital health technologies, as well as space. Uh, I'm gonna share that link in case you're interested. We do have also a one page cheat sheet. If you wanna skip the longer report, you can just go to the single chart. There are recommendations, and as mentioned, we have bipartisan consensus with Senator Mark Warner from Virginia, Senator Rob Portman from Ohio, as well as Representative Suzanne Delbene, who is, of course, championing uh, a U.S. digital privacy center from Washington State, and Representative uh, Mike McCall from Texas. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike, and I hope we can have a robust conversation now on, on how we blend this and move forward together. Well, we have 35 minutes to do that, and uh, I want to thank all of you for being very concise, very provocative and uh, opening the door to lots of good questions. Um, let me ask a really quick question of you, David, and then I've got a quick question for Melissa. So one of the issues on the table is encryption and countries trying to impose severe restrictions on the use of encryption, particularly encrypted communication services because terrorists are using them, criminals are using them. By the year 2026, how many nations around the world will have effective ways to control encryption, the use of encryption by their citizens? That's a good question. So I think um, there's obviously the concern, and I think you know whether it is putting something in the middle so that the encryption looks like it's actually working when it's not, or you know basically yeah, just trying to put a ban. Uh, I think, you know, again, going back to Nick's diagram, if I was to guess, and again, if I had a perfect crystal ball, I'd be playing the stock market right now. Um, but that said, I would probably say, let's estimate that we see 20%. And we see this as a technology that's being exported. Now that said, while we're, we're, we may be caught up in that debate about uh, how many nation states are going to effectively make encryption moot on the internet, let's also just be tracking, and I'm not saying 2026 is a year, uh, but we should start thinking about also quantum resistant algorithms because it may very well be that we embrace encryption only to find out, sorry, that type of that type of encryption is no longer useful in that era as well. So I think it's a dual strategy in which uh, personally, I am not a fan of uh, devaluing encryption. I am all for it. I think, yes, there are risks and you have to find other ways to tackle those issues because what you give up is not worth it. But we also need to be ready for when, even if we do embrace encryption, for encryption to become, as we know it, moot uh, because of quantum computing. Well, just to do a plug for... Um... Last year's IGF USA, there was a very interesting debate over this whole question of encryption. Melissa, I'm going to give you the easiest question. I've gotten several requests. People want to know what the name of your charming dog is yep. and, and whether we can get a picture so that we can put it on the pets of the IGF USA. <laughs> sure. My golden retriever is named Camus after the wine. And then the Australian cattle shepherd mix, because there's two here, uh, her name is Jazz. So yes, I will work on trying to get a picture of them in the in okay. this camera here for well, you. Well, thank you for bringing, bringing them both to the show. Okay. <laughs> Mike, um, Mike, can I just ask a quick question for David? Um, you used the term fishing and whaling. Can, what is... What do you mean by whaling? Yeah, whaling is a specialized form of fishing in which you're going after the CEO. So you're oh, going okay. after a VIP in person. The and, example and... that you gave of the a deep yep. take. Okay. Exactly. That's that's okay. whaling. So. so we've got a couple of questions queued up here. Uh, first, I'm going to turn to Steve Bianco. We mentioned how 
national capitals are trying to close down the internet. And the fact is things are happening right here in the United States. State laws are being passed that are leading certain services not to be available. I, then I'm gonna to turn to a, a, a question from Amir uh, on the Q&A and we'll go from there. So Steve, your question. Hey, uh, thanks, Mike. This is a uh, true and an ongoing example to show a scenario that's both credible and very destructive to innovation and consumer benefits. And it fits tightly with scenario two, but others uh, are interested to react. The state of Illinois enacted the nation's first biometric privacy law in 2008, uh, BIPA, it's called Biometric Information Privacy Act. It was intended to address fingerprint data collector who used the information in an unauthorized way. So the law says that before you collect any biometric information, you require a written notice to the person and then get their written release just to collect it, not to use it. Well, that entitles in this law, anyone whose data is collected without a written release to a $5,000 claim for every incident without any showing that they were harmed or there was any intent to harm them. Well, this has been a real boon to predatory trial lawyers and a real pain for Illinois consumers. The Chicago law firm Edelson is legendary for having brought class action lawsuits on behalf of unnamed and unknown consumers in Illinois who may have used facial recognition to tag faces across their own personal photo albums without getting the wit written release from the family members, friends, and teammates whose photos were in their albums. Edelson won over a billion dollars suing Shutterfly, Apple Photos, Amazon Photos, Facebook, and Google. So today, those services do not allow you and an Illinois customer to tag your own friends and family photos uh, online. Uh, one more. When Amazon and Nest developed doorbells that had cameras on them, people everywhere except Illinois have been able to use it to recognize the faces of family members, daycare providers, housekeepers, and scheduled visitors and delivery men, uh, both to inform your Nest camera that someone's there and to go a step further and unlatch the door if that's what you've connected. But that feature is not available in Illinois. So when the legislator who sponsored that bill saw these unintended consequences, he tried to amend the law, but uh, who do you think spent millions lobbying against amending the law? It was the same law firm whose partners all have yachts and opened an office in San Francisco. So I close by saying that lawsuit abuse by predatory trial lawyers is a particularly American problem so our international audience at the global IGF, they just nod their heads in amazement. But now this really is very much our problem. And it's more than just an unlikely scenario. I'm interested to hear how you panelists think that we can avoid this kind of an outcome via alternate solutions. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Okay, Harriet. Just uh, two quick points um, on that. Uh, thank you. I, I think, uh, uh, there are other states that have passed biometric privacy laws, but they lack a privacy right, a private right of action, and uh, you don't hear about those. And all eyes are on Illinois from a business risk management perspective. And I agree. I think the private right of action is a key issue in the context of uh, consumer privacy legislation here in the United States. And that is one of the details, it's a very important detail that is uh, still to be resolved at the federal level. And I think one answer is to have stronger federal law, but you won't prevent uh, the states from enacting legislation, but I think having a stronger federal law will help. That's one uh, point. The second point is that um, perhaps unbeknownst to many uh, of, of you all, um, Europe uh, has enacted a uh, equivalent of a class action framework uh, via a new directive that is in the process of being implemented uh, member state by member state that over the next several years will uh, actually start allowing for private right of actions, collective actions, as they call them there. That is going to change the game because that combined with the rights under GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, will actually introduce a dynamic in Europe that has never been present before. Europe has always been regulatory uh, and it was always a balance between um, fairly reasonable or rational regulators or the relationship between a regulator and the regulated and the uh, stakeholders. And um, let's figure out what the right approach is with some modicum of fines. And now it's a lot larger under the GDPR. This now introduces a different dynamic that actually 
um, may have the same effect as the as the prior speaker's illustration. So uh, I think that's very some, something to to keep in mind. Um, I don't have any great suggestions for um, uh, managing the environment such that uh, more private rights of actions are not enshrined in legislation. But I think they are symptomatic of when something is really broke, when something people are really angry, and uh, that is an environment which allows it that kind of thing to occur. And I, and I think we're living in an era where lots of people are angry, whether um, you know, for, uh, for various reasons, let's, let's say it that way. And, and real quick, if I could build on what Harriet just said, uh, I really liked what she was sharing in terms of different states, but then also the larger nation state picture. Had COVID not happened, I was waiting for 2020 to be the year in which GDPR collided head on with China's own data rule. Because of course, China's data rule is basically anyone in China, whether you are an individual or a foreign national or a foreign company, has to make their data available to the Chinese government. If you don't, it's their equivalent of a felony. That is complete opposite of GDPR. But of course, the pandemic happened and it didn't get to get uh, determined. But I think we're going to see in the next two to three years cases where either individual nation state rules uh, on privacy and, and internet uh, capabilities or state relative to nation state rules will collide. And it'll be interesting to see how does arbitration happen on the global stage. Harriet, do you have an article or something that? Yeah, uh, I'll post it. I'll post it. I, I saw your helpful. message. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me turn to a question from Amir Makaberi, who really was asking a question of Melissa, but this is also a question for Harriet. Uh, as these countries try to impose new requirements to protect their piece of cyberspace um, and, and do things like Mike Pompeo tried to do with the Clean Network Initiative, it, it, are they going to succeed? I mean, how, how do you actually do that? Is is uh, and and I, I guess the, the 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 more specific question is, are countries going to do what China is doing now with these very vigorous and draconian cybersecurity audits, or are they going to do what Russia is doing, which is trying to build a a drawbridge, you know, sort of a way to pull up the pull pull back the connections and isolate Russia's Russia's piece of the internet. Well, I, I defer I, to Melissa totally on this. Yeah, so I think it's really important if you go back to the previous panel or the panel even before that, that there is an intersection right now on the digital economy, on the competition policy, industrial policy, technology policy, and it's about trade and economics and positioning national champions um, for, you know, the marketplace. And um so I think you, I see a concerted um, national effort um, from a Chinese perspective of positioning, you know, through whether it's the trade deal of RCEP or the Belt and Road Initiative for the national champions and the build out and really kind of changing the uh, changing competition um, broadly. Uh, I also see it in Europe's digital decade of actually becoming more um, European centric and I would argue uh, focused on their own industrial policy and positioning national champions or trying to create national champions in the face that they've only have US and China national champions delivering. And then the US really not taking holistic point of view, in my opinion, that we're still very um, capitalistic laissez faire marketplace. And while the Clean Network Initiative is trying to get to um, a disruptive alliance play to um, against what's going on from a China Belt and Road Initiative, I think that it, it's got a it's got a lot of work that needs to come together from the Quad and the transatlantic and the broader, you know, a Western alliance quasi alliance that's not actually working, I think, well together on research and development, innovation agenda, how you really could pool our dollars together. It's really kind of ad hoc marketplace play um, without a real long term vision of how you would marry up industrial policy, technology policy, competition policy and, and trade. And so this is a battleground of economics and um, and it's already been underway for a decade and and we're late to the party. Um, and uh, and so I think there's a lot more that needs to be thought through and we have to become much more strategic. And what I when I teach the when I teach this or I talk about it, I think you need to really start to overlay the game of risk for those of us who are remembered those games and then with the game of uh uh, the settlers of Catan on the supply lines. And when you play those two together, you start to see different set of strategic properties uh, and how they have to play together. 
That is a great analogy. And as, as somebody whose daughter was a big fan of uh, Catan, I <laughs> really appreciate uh, bringing in the cooperative piece of the puzzle. Um, this isn't just an economics battle, though. It's also a, a, a battle of words. And in the chat, there's been a lot of discussion about sovereignty and this whole idea of data sovereignty and digital sovereignty. That sort of biases the choices. A lot of people are using that word, no, those that phrase, knowing that saying sovereignty puts you in a 350-year tradition. And, and who can be against national sovereignty? Uh, so my challenge for you is, is, is there a better way to to frame it? Is there a different phrase we should be using when the Europeans use digital sovereignty or data sovereignty? The Swiss actually talk about digital self-determination, which I, I like a lot better because it's focused on the self and you being able to determine what you want as opposed to what government wants. But there's also strategic autonomy, which is also a, another great government word. Um, how do, we, how do we counter this? How do we acknowledge that nations have a role here, but they aren't the role, they aren't the only player here. And, and that, that subdividing cyberspace isn't as easy as subdividing the European continent. <laughs> uh, I'll, drum, I'll jump on a hand grenade and I'll be interested in what other people have to say too. But uh, I would say, Michael, uh, I think what you're hitting on is not just the idea of the Westphalian nation state and defined by geographical borders, but the idea that these were things done by government is really coming into the forefront as can all these things be done by government for the future ahead and still be effective. Uh, and, and especially for the internet and everything like that, we need to think about not just, not just government, but two other players, which is obviously the public, but of course, you know, that in that in theory is supposed to be embodied in the will of the government, but there, we know there's challenges there. And, and, and they're also within the public, there are different fractured and, and fragmented tribes there and the tech companies. Cause I think if anything, if you want to talk about in terms of the speed at which these things will happen, the speed at which the things will happen will happen more on the tech companies. Uh, and then the public and government may respond. But if we do not have this be a, a conversation with all three present and that's hard, because um, again, we're not used to doing that. I mean, uh, I, I will say when we were doing the, the bipartisan commission report in the midst of 2020, which in the United States was challenging, uh, we also had tech at the table and, and we, we thought we would get bipartisan buy-in from two different parties, but then we go to tech and they'd say, oh, wait, 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 wait. And then be like, oh. And so this sort of, how do you do coordinated action with disparate actors that may have different goals is very messy. And I think that is going to be, if we can figure out how to do so in a way that is expeditious, will be a way that we get through the next decade. Otherwise, we may end up demonstrating that autocracies that don't ask for anyone else's input may move faster, at least in the short term, than those that actually are trying to do a more pluralistic approach. I'm going to put yeah, Dave I'll, I'll, on I'll the hop spot. In. If you can give us an optimistic outcome here, is there, or, or, or point us to another science fiction writer who may have <laughs> given us um, a world well, where we're actually going to have empowered citizens and the state will uh, uh, let us have our space and our tools and our content and our, our games. Uh, sure. Uh, putting me on the spot a little bit, but you know, this is where the, uh, the multi-stakeholder initiative, I know, um, people overweight those. Um, but, you know, taking it, piggybacking off what David said, um, I think there, there are, if you look at some of the competition backlash and, and, and antitrust and competition, again, with my writer's hat on here, um, I think there's a concern if you're a politician that political power is, is being subsided um, or overwhelmed by transnational corporations. It makes sense to be asking that question, especially when your um, election can, whether you get elected to office, which was the scenario that um, I presented, um, could be impacted by these platforms. It's natural for that those questions to arise. I think the having participated in, in different multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, I think that was the challenge as well which is at least the funding models um, were dominated by um, the, the companies that could pay. That was sort of, you know, their revenue base. So the bigger you are, the more you pay and it weights things in a weird way. But I think it also has to do with this transparency um, of how information is shared and how quickly it's shared. You know, um, 
transparency, even the best transparency initiatives, if, if you, you know, think of this information moving across fiber optic networks at the speed of light, transparency is always going to be slower than that. So how quick can you get? Um, how, can you, how can you share that information in a way that people feel is helpful? Um, so I think that, that balance of, of seeing the innovation happening within the technology sector, um, academia, I think, is, has a huge role to play. Um, and those partner, you do see those partnerships with, with, with tech companies. Um, uh, I think it, it raises, you know, lots of interesting questions, um, in terms of sovereignty, but I think there is, I think sometimes we just have to admit that if you are a politician, um, and you're used to having a certain kind of power and there are now actors who, who are at the table in a way that has never been seen before in history, um, uh, that that's going to create a lot of tensions around this and maybe motivating some of these behaviors around national so sovereignty. We don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I just don't see that uh, wrestling with power in terms of like, uh, yeah, a, a giant platform versus someone who's been elected to office or appointed to office. In terms of the science fiction stories, I mean, Star Trek has imagined it all. So it's hard to go <laughs> where, where people are, individuals are in, empowered and, um, you know, the Federation um, it's all, that's a good place to go. There's a lot, of, and there are a million different episodes. Um, but there are a lot of other, um, Malcolm there, who's, I, I believe has appeared at this conference has imagined, um, you know, different kinds of elected, uh, uh, sovereignties where, um, it's based entirely on population and you can select which population you, you participate in around the globe. So there are different thinkers on this. And what's the name of that book? I think it's called Infomocracy. Infomocracy. Thank you. Yeah, sure. um, I was on a call last week with David Brin, and he pointed to a book by Frank Pohl, uh, Cool War, which is from about 50 years ago. And according to David, outlines a world that looks very scary. Basically, all the countries of the world are using the most vicious cyber attacks they can and disinformation to just bring down civilization. And it's, it's a very nihilist kind of view. And in the 60s, it sounded terribly pessimistic, but today it sounds a little bit like our headlines. Um, one word that's coming up in the chat is interoperability and whether we can get policies that have interoperability built in. Um, so there's a, I think someone mentioned the Universal uh, Law Commission, the Uniform Law Commission. They're just yesterday approved a draft privacy law for state legislatures and the US Congress to consider. And what they did is they didn't say, this is what you gotta do. They said, we will accept your privacy policies if you can show that you are compatible with the following existing codes. Um, and that could include the California law, that can include GDR, uh, GDPR. Um, it, it's sort of a way to say, here's a bar, here are five different ways to reach it. Is interoperability of policy something we can hope for? We, we did it very well with the internet. You can run lots of different technology using the same interoperable standard. <laughs> so Mike, I would say the first step though is, you know, interoperability on what we mean by good outcomes uh, versus adverse outcomes. And I think you're going to find that different nations have differing definitions of that. And that's what makes it hard. Um, and so while it's easier to do it on the tech side, but even then, I mean, we have plenty of examples where interoperability should have happened. Or uh, as I said, you know, uh, as I read in the chat, you know, standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody wants to use one, just not somebody else's. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that, we, we sh in this way, it gets back to Nick's earlier comments about possibly regional blocks, that if we can get at least some coalition of partners to at least agree to something that is a definition of what is good versus adverse outcomes uh, within that block, and then to try and grow membership in terms of those shared norms and values, then we can work on interoperability. But, but that begins with, I mean, we often talk about tech for good and we talk about tech for bad, but we don't actually define what we mean by good and bad. And even within nations, I think there are still differing definitions. Yeah, I got one more thing to jump in on with this. Um, you know, with privacy regulation in particular, the, the really unique thing about privacy, maybe it's not super unique to privacy, but something unique about privacy is that it is extremely contextual. Privacy means different things to different people at different times. And there's this great paper about this called Privacy is an Essentially Contested Concept by Dear 
Richard Mulligan. So, you know, I think with privacy and, you know, with all of these different kinds of, of, of uh, interest areas, blocks only get you so far, even if the block agrees on particular values, but things like privacy interoperability gets difficult because it's so situated in communities and contexts. Thank you. Going back to interoperability. Uh, it, it, but I, I just need to uh, just interject one thing on that. Um, however, I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll repeat a point I made earlier, just with an emphasis. Um, the 80 to 95% of the steps that are common across jurisdictions that if, if you want an organization that collects and manages and handles personal information um, to be respectful of privacy, the steps that can be taken, can be embedded, are actually common. Contextual, yes, um, from an individual's perspective, but the processes and the rights and the frameworks um, can be common across. And that's why I think effectively we have, we're on the verge of getting a somewhat rough consistence of consistent, uh, consistent uh, frameworks of law. And then it becomes a question of values. And you, you will, you'll never get interoperability of values unless, you know, we go to a global culture or blocks of culture, which, um, you know, may happen, but it's uh, more likely to be uh, vertical, vertically striated as opposed to horizontal striated based on, ge ge you know, geography. Other comments on how we can have five different ways to achieve the same goal and get countries to recognize that each of those five ways work, either in privacy or cybersecurity? It's too broad a question. Okay. Well, I mean, how about you might a, be able to, Mike, you, you, real quick, you might be able to get interoperability on outcomes, if that makes any sense. So if you don't prescribe the manner, but you at least get convergence on the outcomes, then that may, that may be something you could achieve. Do we, do we have any models? Is there any place, any other type of law where rather than trying to get a global treaty or some kind of single answer, we went a totally different approach and allowed people to, that sort of performance oriented goals rather than legal standards imposed on everyone. Uh, I'll just say Corey Doctorow had a post recently and he spoke at the conference. Um, I'm not sure if this is from his remarks about adversarial interoperability. So, you know, what benefits can happen when you're, you're not expressly allowed to interoperate um, with, with the technology um, but you, you're able to reverse engineer it basically and then make innovations on top of that without being punished. So you don't have the, the positive, you know, uh, proactive support of whoever you're interoperating with. And that a lot of benefits can arise from that. I think that was more from a corporate competition perspective, but um, still somewhat relevant that there, you don't always need um, permission to interoperate and there can be benefits from not doing that. Yeah, that was one of the most passionate moments of the conference. At least for me, it was uh, very profound. I've heard him talk about adversarial interoperability before. It's a terrible mouthful. It's not a good buzzword. But the concept that we allow the laws, make sure that allow, the law allows people to try to make things work together. The example he gave was that when Facebook was trying to compete against MySpace, the Facebook engineers made this great little subroutine that could scrape all of your data off of MySpace and put it over onto Facebook. Well, if someone tries to do that today to move their Facebook contacts and their posts from Facebook onto a, a new site, um, something like uh, um, uh, Jimmy Wales Wikitrust uh, platform, Facebook would sue the hell out of them. And they could do it using patents and trademarks. Um, okay. Other comments? We have, we have about five minutes left. Uh, in the chat, I posted a, a note to uh, Block by Block, uh, No K. Uh, that's the book by Steve Weber that uh, Nick mentioned. Uh, a phenomenal book on this whole issue of how things uh, are moving and how companies are trying to deal with uh, a global internet that now has five different rule books. 
Um, I'd also mention that Milton Mueller has been an active participant in our chat, and he's also got a very good book from about four years ago. Uh, one of the first people to really try to uh, explain the, the challenges in a, in a layman's, in layman's language. Um, I don't see any other questions. I see lots of comments in the chat. Any questions from the panelists for each other? This is too bad. You were, you were also agreeable. I mean, I'm glad. Well, that we actually, had, I'll toss that one. I'll toss three that of, one. Three of, three of you were, were, you know, good news, bad news. That was, for an optimist, I was very happy to ha hear that. Okay, David, what's your question? Well, I guess for the panelists to consider, I mean, we see varying types of cryptocurrencies, uh, and some seem to be minimal if, if, if no data exhaust, uh, which is an interesting premise. I mean, mm -hmm. one hand, you, you, you want people to have choice and everything like that, but I would ask for the panelists to think about, you know, what, what would be for a, for the U S and, and then maybe what would possibly, uh, others in, in Europe, what, where will they come when it comes to the digital exhaust that's produced either by a cryptocurrency or a central digital bank? Does the individual have the right to turn it off? Um, is it something where if law enforcement kicks in, then they have the right to pull it? Um, these are all going to be interesting, thorny issues that will probably come to a head in the next two to three years. So I just would raise that for the panelists. Yeah, I got one thing on this, which is just that, you know, I think that the, the thing that's interesting to me about that question is how it's settled. Will it be settled through democratic processes, through deliberations and legislatures, or will it be settled maybe something more like, I don't want to use the word brute force, but however these open source projects achieve a level of hegemony, for lack of a better word, that is akin to the way that Linux has achieved a level of hegemony and hegemony in running backend systems. What does that process look like? Who gets to participate in that process? How is that process you know, amended after the fact to uh, you account for other stakeholders who weren't present initially? Those are the interesting questions. Okay, we have time for one minute from each of you. So I'm gonna ask for one more scenario. Between now and 2026, which international organization, not intergovernmental organization necessarily, but what international organization do you think is going to do the most to get the internet working together in a, and moving in a cohesive global way? I, I, you don't have to say the Internet Governance Forum, and I don't think anybody's going to, but is there some activity out there, something that's happening that we haven't maybe noticed that could make a big difference in this whole area? Um, Mike, I'm going to take, uh, say um, my thanks and answer the question that I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned the way of Washington. The way of Washington. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think uh, one, just one question, and maybe it's a provocative statement because uh, I, we are IGF here after all, um, is I, I, I honestly just, I, I work with a lot of different kinds of businesses and organizations, and uh, um, I, I, I wonder how much of the question here or the challenge is ever posed of what's the, what's the effect on the internet? What is, you know, the internet does not seem to be a central part of posing or answering questions. And because I think for, for many, many individuals, perhaps the internet is synonymous with um, the experience they have engaging with major platforms because most are not hobbyists or going off to the, you know, the many of you probably are part of inventing parts of the internet, but, but most do not. So I think there's a, a challenge here in terms of framing something as for the internet. Um, and I, I wonder what happens over the last five years is does the concept of the internet come back in some way and evolve or does it re reduce and not be part of the, the lexicon that we're using for problem solving? And I think that's actually an interesting and sobering question. And I'll leave you with that because I have a, I have to, another commitment. I apologize. Thank you very Thank much, Harriet. I know you had a very busy schedule. I'm so appreciative you could join us. I prefer yeah, to I'll, talk I'll, about the coat, the cloud I'll, of all things. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go uh, uh, next, Mike. Um, so I, I don't have a, a specific organization in, in mind, but I think that um, it will be whatever group of folks, I'll use that term broadly, can uh, provide trust at speed. So I think trust is a, a critically important, but to do it at speed and to do it at the speed the world is moving today, that's really hard. And um, related to that is, 
this concept of shared realities um, that um, it, to the extent that you believe that people are you know, splintering uh, along what, what they believe in and what they don't has always happened with fewer public squares that's come up in other conversations, but how do those shared realities um, pull together and, and lead to, to action? Um, you know, for me, ideally, because of my background, that all this would be underpinned by human rights um, that should apply in the in these contexts. Mm -hmm. So, Nick, what's your answer to this question? Is there a is there a sleeper organization? Is there a group of is there a community out you there? You know, I think this is an intentionally provocative answer, but I think that we can't underestimate the capacity of NATO to enforce a certain norms in the name of security in order to prevent, uh, let's say, uh, fissions forming between allies, where it would be not advantageous from a geopolitical perspective. Whether that will actually happen, whether that can happen, I don't know. But, you know, it's something I like to think about sometimes, what it would look like and why that, um, you know, why that might come to pass insofar as NATO is meaningful in uh, preserving stability among those allies. Okay, Melissa, you know something about NATO. I don't think NATO is the answer, um, and because that really just excludes the whole fact of what's going on in China and the ASEAN. Um, if you were, uh, if if you accept that this is about the digital economy and about digital flows of data that is monetized and 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 contributes to our economies. Uh, the organization that should embrace it for for economic stability should be the G20, and um, because they have eighty percent of the resources, they have the majority of the population, they have the they have the flows. And if you think of it as the G2, U.S. and China as the predominant players right now, and then you know, and then the other economies that are all either they're going to buy or you know participate. It, that that's. To me, you know, while the G20 is, is not as effective as it could be, probably it is the place where the economics play out. So, and it and is the place where the heads of state are meeting so that and they it's, don't. And it's neutral. It's not NATO, which is not neutral. Yeah. You have to pick something that's global and that includes the largest economies and the biggest powers that can drive change for the, for the world. Yeah. My colleagues and I are doing some work on digital leadership and how the countries that are doing the right things are the ones where the heads of state actually engage and start banging the heads of the ministers together until they come to consensus or come to their senses. So David Bray, you have the last chance to answer the big question. Is, is the Geotech Commission the answer or is there no, some no, other no, place? No, 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 we are just simply one, one piece in a much larger puzzle. I was actually going to say G20, so I will give a plus one to Melissa, but I will, I will then offer an alternative future as well. So should the G20 not rise to the occasion, it will be those tech companies that are doing internet and space that create something completely new. Yeah. So Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos will connect the world and bypass the regulations we've been talking about for 75 minutes. Well, thank you very much. I want to really say thank you to the people who were engaged in the chat, the questions that were asked. Um, you, you had an incredibly hard assignment to take on these issues in just four or five minutes, and you did it well. Um, I'm going to go back and listen again to make sure I got everything at least once. Uh, I apologize for the technical problems, but uh, I have a voice for radio and a face for radio. So maybe it was good that you didn't have to see my lips move. Take care. And I hope you'll hang around for the virtual mixology class, uh, learn how to make all sorts of internet themed cocktails. And I hand it over to Melinda and 